Welcome to Reels on the Rocks, the show where your hosts Whiskey and Sweet Tea discuss film from the unpretentious perspective. It's Whiskey's favorite time of the year, Spooktober. So dust the cobwebs off your liquor cabinet and join us for Whiskey's Nightmare in a Rocks class. In tonight's episode, we discuss the stop-motion horror, Coraline. Don't forget to turn out the lights, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and as always, please be advised that spoilers are ahead. Welcome back, everyone, to a Nightmare on the Rocks. Is that the right way to say it? <laughs> Close! Nightmare on a Rocks class. You know, I'm really going to have to start bringing you into these marketing meetings. <laughs> well, anyway, welcome back to Spooky Month, everyone. We're back for our second out of two spooky episodes this week. It's my pick. And if you can read, you'll know that it is 2009's Coraline. Um, and it's actually, like, it's... It's one of my favorite movies. Uh, well, one of my favorite animated movies. And I guess we're going to have a lot to talk about. Because this 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 episode's probably going to go all over the place. But there <laughs> is a lot to unpack here. First of all, I'll, I'll start with a fun little uh, kind of fun fact that some people know, some people don't. I feel like it's like a big Tim Burton fan, like gotcha moment. But Sweet Tea, who directed Nightmare Before Christmas? I... Okay, I don't think it was Tim Burton, though. But yes. It wasn't him, but he was, like... I think, wasn't he involved in the project, like, in name only So he, he wrote it and produced it. Okay. So, like, the story was his... The reason he didn't do it was he was too busy with Batman Returns. Got but, it. Uh, so it's, I guess you don't know who did direct it, then. I don't know who directed it. The same director of Coraline. His name's Henry <sighs> Selleck. And okay. he... You know, it's funny. I thought that he kind of had a resurgence in his career after this movie i i knew i knew before going into this episode that i was wrong about this but when it came out i thought that he went on to direct paranorman which was a later film by Leica, the company that did this mm -hmm. and i was wrong and when i was researching for this i was very wrong because he has not made a movie since this movie which is weird um like so since you don't know henry Selleck, he kind of got famous for doing nightmare before christmas even though everyone thought tim burton directed it yeah that's how it was marketed but it helped his career because he went on to do james and the giant peach oh okay um, and what else did he do well like so he did that um the movie that ruined his career was a half animated half live action film called monkey bone I have never even and heard of that. And it was like, <laughs> it's so weird. I have only seen bits of it on TV. And it's it's also, it kind of ruined, um, oh shoot, what's his name? Uh, Brendan Fraser. He was the star of Monkey Bone. And that was also kind of towards the, you know, when his career started floundering a little bit. Right. Uh, so this was the first movie he did after Monkey Bone, which was like the early 2000s. So it had been a while. And it looks like he's coming out with a movie next year. So it looks like he might be doing something. Oh, it's but animated? I was under the impression that Coraline kind of reinvigorated his career, and he, it didn't. But Henry Selleck, uh, he's he's a very good animator. I actually like his movies a lot, even going back to like those things he did when I was a kid, like James and the Giant Peach. They, they're they Tim Burton adjacent. Like They kind of remind you of Tim Burton, but they're they're not. Mm -hmm. With this movie, um, we'll get into the, the straight facts uh, first off. Um, so it came out in February 6th of 2009, and it actually, one thing we'll probably end up discussing later in the episode is this was a very historic Oscars, the 2010 Oscars. Um, and it was, it did not win Best Animated Feature, but it was going up against Up. Oh, yep. Yeah, that would so, do it. Which I was rooting for this, uh, even though Up is one of my favorite Pixar movies. I just, I like it when smaller right. films beat them. And that was a really stacked year. So that year, it was actually, um, so Up, which won. Uh, Coraline, Fantastic Mr. Fox, which was a good one as well. Uh, the Princess and the Frog. Oh, that was that year too. And The Secret of Kells, which is an Irish animated film, which I haven't seen, but from my understanding, it involves, like, fairies, but, like, Irish fairies, so, like, leprechauns and all of these other like, different sorts of I'm willing things. To, um, I'm willing to bet it also had Will of the Wisps in it. <laughs> I, that, I literally think Kells, like, the title character is a Will of the Wisp or <laughs> something like that. Anyway, I haven't seen the movie, but it was really good. Everyone said it was really good. And what's crazy 
and I would not have known this if I wasn't uh, researching, is that this film and The Secret of Kells actually had the same composer. Oh. So weird, right? Re- weird coincidence. I did not know that. I did not know that until researching. But so, yeah, he, <laughs> he was up for that. Um, directed by Henry Selleck, uh, the composer that also composed for The Secret of Kells is named Bruno Colais. I, it, I, it looks like he's French. I, we'll, call, probably, we'll call him Bruno. Maybe it's Calais. It's Bruno. I, let's, Bruno. <laughs> we'll at least um, know that. Uh, this cast is pretty interesting. Um, Coraline Dakota Fanning, uh, who also, in an earlier review from this year, voiced uh, Satsuki from My Neighbor Totoro. Yes. <laughs> uh, the cat is Keith David. And this has a connection to an earlier review. Uh, Keith David is the African American gentleman from The Thing, the one who also survives till the end with Kurt the, Russell. Oh, the other guy. <laughs> yeah. So an actor from The Thing plays the cat. Uh, the mom slash Beldam is Terry Hatcher, which she mostly has a TV career. Uh, but maybe, and actually, I don't know if you've seen this, but probably the most famous thing that she was in was she played Lois Lane on Lois and Clark in the nineties. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think I've seen parts of that. Gotcha. So I've got some more notes here. Oh, well let's get into it. So this was well-received obviously it was nominated for an Oscar, but it's budget was 60 million gross just in the U S and Canada was 75 million. So, you know, not crazy. But globally, it got 124 million. So worldwide, it did very, very well. Um, so that is all of the basic facts on the movie. But I am very interested in just your first thoughts. I was very sad. I was sad that I did not get to see this as an adolescent because oh, this was Dude, so such this, this this was such a beautiful, beautiful animated film. This was also uh, kind of at the beginning of the 3D craze. So yeah. I saw this in theaters with the 3D effect. And sadly, like, so when it came out on Blu-ray, they did release it in 3D, but it was like the cheap 3D with the two different colors. Oh, I see. So I hated that, but it's probably, there's probably a better version of it now. But so this was intended to be in 3D. And you can kind of tell in the opening credit sequence mm-hmm. with the doll kind of coming out at you and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad. So it sounds like you liked it. I no, I was I, it's, so I watched this. It was so good. I loved it. And like I said, I was sad that I didn't get to see this as an adolescent because as an adult now with more uh, knowledge of film things, I picked up on things faster than I feel like I would have as a kid. And I would have gotten to enjoy, you know, some of the other stuff, which is it's not the movie's fault. I'm just saying I would have as a kid been able to. I mean, I wasn't a kid. I was like a freshman in high school when it came out, but I was younger and more naive and I wouldn't have picked up on things as quickly because this was just such a, and I keep thinking it was, it was a beautifully animated film. It was, the story was super interesting and it just, I don't know. It was one of those movies that just made me feel good. And I will also say this, and maybe you were planning to bring this up. This movie uh, gave me Pan's Labyrinth vibes. Oh, yes. I, so I was part of the reason I was excited to hear what you thought was I feel like this has a lot of similarities. And I know and just so this is intended to be we'll get into the author a little bit later. But so this was actually written by a well-known writer named Neil Gaiman for his daughter uh, as like a scary bedtime story. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's very much supposed to be kind of in the same vein as like a classic fairy tale, spooky right. sort of, you know, thing like well, that. Well, I mean, the big thing um, for me was the door. <laughs> oh. I'm like that. I'm like, that has to be an obvious reference. Cause this was only three years later. Um, but I was just, Oh yes. With Pan's Labyrinth. Yes. 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 Um, but um, yeah, yeah. I honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if, cause I, I feel like, honest because sometimes there's like just coincidences like people coming up with the same idea you see that all the time in hollywood with movies that are like the same coming yeah. out at the same time <laughs> deep impact uh, so I, like, I don't know how long guillermo del toro was working on pan's labyrinth but i wouldn't be surprised if he saw this and maybe came up with that idea but i would think that he's probably had been working on it longer well than no no this no, movie. no what, what or i'm maybe saying he read the book that's the other thing what a, i i actually wouldn't be surprised if he's a neil gaiman fan so well i wouldn't be surprised if I, he actually, read the book and actually what i was saying was was um 
again, I don't know when the, when this book was published by Neil Damon, but at least the visuals and stuff was, I thought may have been inspired by it because Pan's Labyrinth came out three years before um, this movie did. Um, oh, gotcha. The book was published in 2002. Okay, then um, yes, maybe he was inspired by that because he read so many have... fairy tales for it. <laughs> The handy thing about this movie is uh, it's not super different from the book. I've, I've mentioned this YouTube show before, but there's this cool little, I, th- I think Cinefix is the channel, but they do this series called What's the Difference, where they take a movie that was also based on a book and they compare what the differences are. And this one is very, like... It's not even worth pointing out the differences because most of the <laughs> changes were the like made for pacing and things like that. So like not really a big difference between the book and the movie. Um, and that was actually interesting too. Uh, Henry Selleck wrote the screenplay. So Neil Gaiman wrote the book, but he didn't touch the screenplay. So this is actually like something that Henry Selleck wrote, which is again, part of part of why a lot of people think Monkey Bone was so terrible is because he wrote that too. So it's funny, like you know, yeah, wait, give the guy some credit. He he did write. Well, something the que- the question is: Is Monk was Monkey Bone an original idea? Yeah. Okay. See, that's the problem. <laughs> that's actually a good point too, because well, most of his like so you Nightmare Before Christmas was Tim Burton's story. James and the Giant Peach was based off of a Roald Dahl movie. Well, I mean, um, I mean, the the example I always point there are some people that just can't do original properties um, that they come up with on their own. Somebody else come up like Francis Ford Coppola. His big movies were all adapted, and his I guess you would consider them flops or whatever, or not up to his caliber. The ones that he actually wrote. I honestly, that makes a lot of sense because my favorite's Apocalypse Now, but and you can make an argument that it's very different from uh, uh, into uh, Heart of Darkness, mm-hmm. but um. But he didn't write. He that didn't screenplay. write it though. Yeah. Is the thing. Like, like he... in fact, Milius uh, wrote it. Uh, really, really cool screenwriter from that era. So yeah, no, it's the same thing. And I, I think that probably is Henry Selick's issue because uh, he, uh, I do think he's talented, and he mm-hmm. hasn't made enough movies for you to really dive into his, you know, his catalog. Mind. Yeah, yeah, because most of it was like kids' movies from the '90s, and then after Monkey Bone came out, he kind of disappeared, and then you've got this. Um, Let me ask you is... something, because I yes. remember there was a period with animated films, at least marketed towards kids, and I think and I I don't know if this started it, and at least from my, my perspective was, or if it was in the middle of it, but there seemed to be a block of time where there was kind of like this resurgence of kind of like macabre like kids movies like Coraline, Corpse Bride, Frankenweenie, and uh, Paranorman and they all kind of came out like around or at least very close together. And was that was this part of that sort of thing or am I just you know misremembering this phenomenon? It's in the same uh it's in the same kind of time frame. Some of it I think was uh Tim Burton like kids that grew up with Tim Burton animated movies like the kids like me and you who grew up with the nightmare before christmas were like teenagers and we wanted to see that again and corpse bride came out and then obviously there's a market for this so let's make Coraline and let's make you know so i I don't think you're imagining it but i don't i don't think it was as prevalent i think a lot of it had to do with kind of marketing to a demographic of people who like that sort of thing Mm -hmm. and also hot topic had become a thing and that was (laughs) something that they you know like when corpse bride came out it's like a whole section of the store i am embarrassed same thing with Coraline. i remember Coraline was uh pretty again it wasn't as big as like a disney movie but it was certainly a big deal and they definitely were like from the director of nightmare before christmas and stuff when it came out so which that's a sneaky way because they want you they they didn't they didn't say his name probably but they they, do that all the time because they 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 wanted you about it too they wanted you to think tim burton (laughs) well they'll say that like they'll be so vague like from the makers of and what they mean is it's the same company like the same producers but a completely different filmmaker and then you see the movie and it sucks and you're like did so and so really direct it and then you watch that's why like and apparently it was good but like when Candyman the trailer dropped and they're like from the makers of get out and i was like 
did Jordan Peele direct this? And I look and it's like, no, he didn't. Okay. So already strike against you guys. Like, I think it was just, you're, what you're was lying it? Wasn't me. it just produced by him or something? Or he was a producer? It's from something? his, I think it's from his company again. So from the critics, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, the critics said it was good. Um, also the newer trailer I watched and it got rid of most of my problems with it. I think it's monkey paw, which is Jordan Peele's company. So I think got that's it, okay. like he produced it. Like, even though he didn't write it or anything. I just, but I just remember getting, and it's, I got swag for that about three years ago when it was supposed to come out. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's a thing. It's it, the reason they do it is because it works. When yeah. you hear that, especially if you're not like a film nerd, like the two of us, if you're just your average, like movie goer mm-hmm. and you hear, Oh, from the makers of this, you're just going to think, Oh, it's a Tim Burton movie or something. And then you're going to go and, see it and not really dig into it whatever you and i look into things because we've been burned in the past and because we also know how marketing works. we've had our hearts sort of broken thing. by the, by hollywood <laughs> yeah right so it's it's you're not imagining things yeah because uh, I, I, think... I thought there was a, some movie came out and then like it's like and then all of a sudden there was like this you know train of just you know kind of macabre kids movies that came out or, like after it and i, and I thought but i didn't know corpse bride started it not this that's what i was gonna say my finger would point at corpse bride because that did very well and i think that uh you know people you know executives and studios looked at that and they were like oh this does well mm-hmm okay, there's a market for this. Um, let's make something like this and then say, you know, oh, who's who's available? Henry Selleck? Oh, he directed Nightmare Before Christmas? I thought Tim Burton directed Nightmare Before Christmas. Well, let's get him to direct this. Um, I, but speaking of, I speaking of companies, <laughs> right? But speaking of companies, uh, this was made by Leica, which is spelled L-A-I-K-A. So I think I'm pronouncing it correct. I've never heard it said out okay, loud. But clearly, sure it's clearly it's Leica. No, I don't know. <laughs> Leica. Well, so it's this was their first movie, as far as I could tell. They're only 16 years old as a company. Mm-hmm. Um, and you might have seen some of their other movies. You've seen... Did you see Paranorman? No. I discovered... It's really good. So I that discovered was my horror, you know, kind of interest later in life <laughs> you should check out paranorman uh i won't say it's not about the undead it's very i think you would love it especially knowing that you liked this i think you might even like paranorman more than this mm-hmm. because of what the movie is really about but i'm not going to spoil that here so okay, they did yes. that they did kubo and the two strings which was awesome uh they did box actually you know i think box trolls came out before this that might have been Excuse me, that might have been their first movie. So they did Box Trolls, and then the most recent thing they did was Missing Link. Oh, and that was and a partnership just, with MGM. I remember that. There you go. So that was that was Leica or Leica. Um, and they're also, uh, interestingly, not based out of Hollywood. They're from a, you know, just outside of Portland, Oregon, which <laughs> I thought was interesting because this takes place around Portland, Oregon. Oh, that makes that actually makes sense, though. Yes, and that's also why I thought, oh, maybe this is their first movie. And I might be right about that, but I feel like Box Trolls came out before. But I also, I didn't see Box Trolls. I don't know. And if he's wrong, Um, listeners, he will personally hand address envelopes with um, Canadian quarters to you. No, we can do our first YouTube apology. (laughs) (laughs) We were wrong. We were so wrong. I'm so sorry. Can you fake cry? I'm very disappointed in myself. Remember to mention this is about you and not your family. (laughs) No, but I want to say... I'm just really disappointed I let down all my fans. (laughs) Well, I just want to say this has so far been, I think, my favorite movie that you have introduced me to. This I don't oh, know. There, there was something about this movie that just made me want to cuddle up with a blanket and have hot Dude, chocolate. Dude, it's a perfect. It's such a rainy day movie. Like if the weather's nasty and I don't have anything to do, I'll just like make myself a bowl of soup and watch this. It's definitely like a mood movie. Like, well, so, you, know, you can watch it at any time, but like it's really good for like rainy days. Like any any sort of day that kind of looks like the movie you know as as someone who who frequents the reddit memes and stuff i'm sure you <laughs> might have even picked up that uh Coraline's dad is like a meme format format on the internet 
<laughs> have you seen that? Like, there's I, a bit where it's actually like, looking like. Now that you say that, I put that together because I'd seen that before, but I hadn't made the connection until you said that. <laughs> yeah, I've I noticed that. I've been seeing that meme a lot where it's like, oh, so you did the thing, or like I, I don't even know. Like, I've seen it used in a variety of formats, but so it's popular enough that people uh, <laughs> people have turned him into a meme. But uh, going into, like, since, since you enjoy the content, we'll go into the meat of the story. So if anyone hasn't seen it, uh, what's wrong with you? Go see it. Uh, spoiling the recommendation for the end. <laughs> oh, you know what? Before we get into the meat of it, we haven't said what we're drinking. Well, I was right last, last episode. Um, I'm still doing the Sauvignon Blanc. Um, or not Sauvignon Blanc, the Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, same, I, I have... I'm still doing the same box of wine, so there's that. What it's about okay. you? Are you still being healthy? I'm still being healthy, but this time I switched it up and put apple slices in there. Would not recommend, Ooh. though. Would not recommend? <laughs> Would not recommend. Yeah, it's kind of a weird pairing for water. <laughs> I know, but I was like, ooh, let me try to not like have as much acid ingested into my you know already acid heavy stomach. <laughs> I mean, at right. least the apple works as like a good snack. It does. But anyway. a snack afterwards. So, if you are one of the unlucky who have not seen this movie before, the the gist is that Coraline, with her family, who write about plants, move to a small town in Oregon um, into this very weird kind of duplex that's very old. And she's, you know, warned, like, you know, kids disappear and stuff like that. And she's she really doesn't like that she lives in this new house and she doesn't like the town and her parents aren't spending a lot of time with her so she happens upon a little door that leads to a dual version of her house where everything is exactly the way she wants it and she's got duplicates of all of her friends and her mom and dad but they all have buttons in their eyes And as it turns out, this is a horrible monster called the Bell Dam that essentially seals children's souls by getting them to walk in to there. And that's actually, you know, we'll get it. Let's talk about the character design for the Bell Dam, because I think it's genius with the whole sewing things and kind of making that taking that and making her into a spider and using the whole other world as like a web. Well, well, okay, so. My one of my favorite things, and I was and I was like, oh, I love this reveal, is when she goes back to being her gross self, and yeah. you, and you get her and we get her hands. I'm like, oh, she was the one that sewed the doll. I mean, probably she most likely was, but you know, we didn't get any confirmation yet. But I loved that reveal. I'm like, oh my god, it's her without without it being obvious. Uh, yeah. And something I kind of picked up. I was like, and maybe this again. I've said this before. Maybe this is because I've watched the X Files for like years. Um, I, there was, when she, I think it's after they have the variety show and she's taking them, her back to the house or whatever. When she's walking up the stairs, I was very aware that the back of her dress looked very bug-like. And I was just like, is she going to be made out of bugs or something like that? Because <laughs> if you look- nah, she's made out of sewing needles, <laughs> which is even cooler. <laughs> but do um, you know, do you know what I mean though? When you were talking about the back of her dress, it kind of looks, yeah, no, it, it looks like, like an, an a even, thorax or something. Well, well, and even if you notice like in the house and stuff, like a lot of the furniture and a lot of the, you know, lamps and stuff, they're all based off of bugs. You kind of notice that later in the movie when some of them literally come to life and crawl away. Um, but bugs are a big theme and the the spider character design for the bell dam is genius for me because of kind of what she's doing to trap Coraline is getting her to walk into her own trap the same way a spider doesn't catch flies they just let the fly fly into their web oh so oh, oh, like i, I don't love, know i don't think i love I d- the use of the buttons in that web scene where you know now that she doesn't have eyes anymore she uses the vibrations of her in the web, which is what spiders oh, yeah. do. Oh my God. Okay, I'm sorry, but I love that. Okay, go on. <laughs> no, for sure. I just like, honestly, I, I don't think that that was actually in the book. I might be, again, I haven't read the book. I just watched that. What's the difference thing. But, uh, I don't think that the bell dam was described as being spider like. So I think that might've been on the part of the filmmakers. I might be wrong about that. But I loved that. I loved the character design of kind of the warped, scarier versions of all the second monsters, like, in in the other world. Um, Like, in how they were almost kind of, like, warped 
version because all of her neighbors are like very nice people mm-hmm. but it takes them and like it's almost like a funhouse mirror like it distorts their personalities to something really weird and creepy well, and and something I was planning on touching on, I guess we'll get into that with that point, is, like, so this, I would still, cons- it is a kid's movie, but I would still consider it a horror movie. And I like bringing this movie up a lot because, you know, you hear this a lot with, like, Pixar movies and stuff where it's like, you know, don't write a kid's movie to be stupid. Kids aren't stupid. And I kind of think it's the same way with being scary, you don't need, like, and I've said this with, like, grown-up horror movies, too. You don't need to be gory, and you don't need to have jump scares or whatever to be scary. The simplest little thing can be scary. And, like, I've shown this to other people who've never seen it before, and when the reveal comes that they want to sew buttons into Coraline's eyes, yeah, that... every person I've ever watched this movie with is like, oh my god you know what because that's scary and it's such a simple thing but it is so disturbing well and i remember because like i said i didn't see i had never seen this movie until i watched this now but i remember even i think this is why because i've i've been a wuss most of my life when it comes to like scary movies i remember see i think there was a trailer or maybe it was like the dvd release trailer or something where they point that out and i was like oh my god i'm good pass on this like even just that thought like even without seeing the movie just that thought of that occurring possibly in this film i was like no no hard pass i'm it's good it was that scary things. to me yeah you know it's like that yeah. whole concept with those like two sentence horror stories you know the simplest things can be terrifying you know like i you like like the scratching at your door is comforting unless you live alone you know <laughs> like yeah something well, like that. And, and i the buttons is the most obvious example but then there's other things too like the uh the, oh, the, oh. like near the end of the movie where her parents just disappear you see this in a lot of other like rolled doll stories and stuff where it's just the or you could even like let's use an r-rated movie as an example it recently like uh 2017 the first one just the idea of like little kids having to deal with something that could probably kill their parents <laughs> Is uh and and the fact that the monster renders the parents helpless is scary. Like I mean, that point in the movie where her parents never come back, and then she finds them trapped in a snow globe, and it's like, oh my god! Like you, you're you're literally on your own. Like that is a terrifying thing for a kid or even an adult. I still think this movie's scary. And even when this came out, I was like a teenager, and I thought it was. And, and the 3d effect man uh especially when the bell dam is like lurching towards her at the end of the oh movie, yeah the 3d it's like ah <laughs> to me i think what was the most terrifying thing watching it this time around was when i have to be careful how i say this why be <laughs> why born uh, well i know <laughs> but the way they were talking i was like are, are they saying the other thing <laughs> um but when yb the i guess the button yb shows up and his mouth is sewn into a smile that was mm, yeah mm. no that one still ugh, it chills every time that happens it's partly also there's like a little sound effect almost like a, a violin screech or something when she turns him around and it's ooh, it's it's just un, ooh, it's creepy speaking, i know what you mean speaking of that character the button yb so at first i thought that she had somehow lured yb into this world but you know it turns out no he's just one thing so but she said she had to fix him and everything but if she created him why was he still why was he still on Coraline's side do you know what i mean it's a good question um because like because like if he had been lured in because at first i thought he was the yb in the real world because um, i don't think he shows up in the later world in, in the button world i don't think he shows up in the real world after he shows up in the button world so like i said i no, thought he's never he never goes like he, as far as he's concerned he tells her about a lot of this stuff not about the bell dam or the, he just says like oh a bunch of kids are always missing my my mom ma- my grandma had a twin sister who disappeared in that place so like he's aware that it's a like he knows something is up but he doesn't know what's going on and as far as the movie goes he never sees any of it Mm -hmm. it's easy to think that he does because you remember button yb yeah Uh, but yeah like technically he's honestly he must have been confused for a lot of it too because by the end of the movie Coraline's like really nice to him and stuff so he's probably just like what happened well and then there was that scene um i think when she comes back i think it's one 
was it after her parents disappeared or was it just before he comes by and he is like I don't know he asks about the doll again or something and she's like oh my god no she's evil and he, she basically flips out and he's like you're weird bye for some reason the way that it was kind of shot or the way it's portrayed I for like one for like a for a weird brief second I thought that maybe this was like some other like like uh what's what I'm looking for adjacent world I know something about it was just kind of off to me and then I'm like oh no it was the real world but I remember thinking something's off here something's like wrong um the fact that the movie even makes you think that way it's like it makes you paranoid and just another another simple and creepy thing the idea that that doll version of Coraline is watching her right what? It's literally the sort of thing that you're scared of when you're a little kid, but the idea of it being real, even as an adult, like, oh, it just makes you want to burn the doll. It's so creepy. And it's not even like a, an Annabelle doll. It's just this very simple little little rag doll with button well, eyes and suddenly well, it's whiskey, like, Ugh, don't you know don't you know the birds are watching us they're all government drones I'm just <laughs> yeah birds aren't real guys no, <laughs> that's my favorite conspiracy theory i love that most of the people like well it is a joke like it's a parody anyway off topic but uh but yeah no like this is something that comes up with like children's films a lot like oh you know something can still be for kids and be deep mm -hmm. and this is like when I say I like horror as a genre, it's like this is a good scary movie for kids because it it's it it has such a mastery over suspense and mm -hmm. over you know the uncanny and over like you know just the simple sort of things that still scare people, you know, like being watched or you know like your family members not really being their family members or like you know things like that and and it's the same with this as it is with like kids movies you don't have to have like a big boogie monster coming at, like it you can still be subtle and it can still be creepy and it can still get under your skin even like for the whole family you know um so my and... question is because i brought up at the beginning that i like i wish i had seen this movie you know as a kid so i got to experience it as a kid because there's certain things that i picked up on pretty early in the film that I'm kind of like, would I have picked up on this if I was if I had seen this as a kid? And one of them was, like, right from the beginning, and it's you had siblings, right? Or am I wrong? Did you know? Yeah. So you know, like when like your sibling is suddenly nice to you, you're like, what's wrong with you? What do you want? Right. Yeah. So like right from the beginning, when she's like, oh, we wanted you to have a nice dinner. My first thought was. Okay, what's wrong with her? <laughs> and I wondered. I'm wondering if if I'd seen this as a kid, if I had not, that had not been my first instinct. Like, well, I think, as, like, as a, honestly, I think it's already pretty. It's a big red flag, like that they all have buttons in their eyes to that, begin yes. with. Yeah. You know, like I, I even, I mean, obviously, like I said, I was a teenager when this came out, but like, you know, I was like, okay these are monsters or something like this this is wrong <laughs> like and they're too nice professional help yeah exactly going into i guess we'll talk about uh deal gaiman a little bit do you know anything about him i know zero about him <laughs> so he is a writer and i use the term as an umbrella term because he's written books he's written movies he's written comic books in fact the comic nerds if any of you are listening um no you're probably screaming at me to say to talk about sandman talk <laughs> about i know i trust me and i still need to finish sandman but he's so he his one of his bigger uh novels american gods uh actually was turned into a tv series on showtime or was it Ooh, it's one of those like subscription like hbo i think it was showtime but it might have been uh something else but it was super popular um and that book actually came out right before he wrote this so that came out in like 2000 2001 and then Coraline came out in 2002 um and I like doing my research I looked up uh an interview with him uh but just so you know like he he's very good at typical like fables myths like his in fact American Gods the story of that is that it's the the old gods of the world are being replaced by new gods and so they're like going to war with the new gods to like have like supremacy over people and it's it's kind <laughs> of like about the uh 
the mixing pot of the United States and how like all of these uh, immigrants come in with their customs and they're dying off because their kids are like being more into, you know, pop stars and sort of things like that. So it's all these, these actual gods from all these different, uh, you know, religions around the world. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, it's really cool. I, I, the book is apparently incredible and everyone was raving about the series when it premiered. And it's still going on. I think it's on season three now. I might be wrong, but it's it's really interesting. And that's kind of the thing. I, I uh, As far as what I have read from him, Sandman is a character he did for DC. And he's literally the Sandman. Like, so he, he is a god and he can control sleep. And he is a part of the DC universe. So is this knows, one of maybe? the Batman villains? No, he's a good guy. Okay. Well, kind of. I mean, he's he's a god. He can do whatever he wants. There's, but like, a, there's so... a sand something in one of the Batman things that I remember. That gave me no, Clayface. Scene. Sandman is a villain Spider-Man. Okay. But this isn't this isn't Marvel. So, the, like, he, you know how the Sandman, it's like, oh, he can make you go to sleep and he gives you good dreams and all yeah. that sort of stuff. So that's what he can do. And the interesting thing is, like, he's very smart with how he writes him. So even though that sounds like kind of a weird superpower, it's like he can he can make it so you can't fall asleep and you'll, like, go insane from, like, waking nightmares. Oh, my God. Right? Like, sounds so like even though... Game. <laughs> yeah. And he's, like, his sister is death and she's super nice, which a lot of... There's a lot of comic book fans who, like, you know, have a crush on her. And I don't blame... But she's, like, that very friendly goth girl. So, yeah, that's that's his series. I need mm-hmm. to finish it. Well, this American God series sounds just fascinating. Check it out. I bet you could watch it. Uh, the series looks really cool. And they've got, like, some weird gods, too. Like, they've got, like, Chernabog from Russia. Like, there's, like, he's... <laughs> you might remember him from uh, Fantasia. Okay. Like, if you ever watched... You remember the devil thing? Yeah. That's Chernabog. And he's, like, this demonic entity from Slavic mythology. And he's a character in American Gods. There's one who's, like... He reminds me of a leprechaun, uh, but he's he's not a leprechaun. He's, like, the god of, like, wealth or something from, like, Ireland. There's a whole bunch of them. There's all sorts of different cultures. There's one from Africa who's really cool, who uh, is, like, in African mythology is usually, like, a spider. And I think it's a woman. It's crazy. But so that's what Neil Gaiman's all about. And so the book he wrote as a bedtime story for his daughter... Let's see where my notes are. Holly. And this is one of the books that took him the longest to write. So he took, he was writing this before he was writing American Gods. Mm -hmm. Um, And ironically, it's also the shortest book he ever wrote. So, um, and sometimes he would take a break writing it for up to like four years. So the ironic thing is he started writing it for Holly, but by the time the book was finished, his daughter Holly was all grown up and he ended up like dedicating it to his daughter Maddie, that's who was cute. like at the appropriate age. But that's how long it took him to write the book. So in the interview, he mentioned that everyone loved it, kids and adults, but something that was he thought was interesting was that kids didn't get scared by the book, but parents that read it were like, oh my God, I was terrified. Oh um, and the way he interpreted that is that um, kids didn't get scared because, quote unquote, they don't know how much trouble she's in. <laughs> and I kind of understand that because, again, like I watched this as a teenager and the part the part that gets really kind of dreadful in the movie is when her parents are trapped. Oh, yeah. Because, as I said, it's like at that point, she is on her own. No one can get her out of this except herself. Wait, actually, now that you say that and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when her parents uh are revealed to be trapped in there i don't think we see and i think even when she's looking for them i could be wrong no wait af no it's after that they revealed their trap we don't see a single other adult in that movie until no. uh besides the neighbors uh the well, nice old ladies that make her that little like eye piece thingy oh, that true. she can use to but they're so, so. but they're so like they, they basically come across as crazy so you you basically just feel like she has literally no one to turn to but the oh, fact sure. the fact that they just they they excluded them, I was like, oh my god, that makes so much sense. But I thought that was a really insightful thing by Neil Gaiman, and I also just thought it was interesting because I didn't realize little kids didn't find it scary. 
I'm, I guarantee some little kids probably found the movie scary. It might be different when you're hearing it as a bedtime story. I just thought that was an interesting insight by him. Um, I mean, I told you I was the biggest wimp ever. I, w- I was too scared by the trailer to see this movie. <laughs> I was just like, um, oh my god, button eyes. No, no, no. It ruined button eyed <laughs> dolls forever. <laughs> yeah, now you have to turn them all away from you so the Beldam's not... S- not uh spying on you (laughs) so he another interesting thing he said uh, in the interview was like he he said Coraline was a wonderful spooky little book um and normally with his books he says he feels as much of a craftsman the same way like he looks at his books the same way a really talented craftsman might look at a chair or a table they made Mm -hmm. but with Coraline he feels more like a father or a parent that's kind of that's actually kind of sweet I'm sure it's a super personal story to him. Yeah, and I'm sure um, I'm sure when he was also writing it, he was in his head envisioning, you know, his own child probably going through this ordeal. Oh, I bet that uh, Holly was probably the inspiration for Coraline, um, no doubt. Especially the fact that both her parents are writers. It's yeah. like, huh? Pro- you mean like Neil Gaiman and maybe his oh. wife is a writer? <laughs> well, the real question is, is, is Neil also incredibly depressed? <laughs> he looks like, he look, he look, he doesn't look quite like Coraline's father. He actually looks a lot like Sandman, which is funny. He's like very skinny, like long, curly black hair. He looks like something like a goth girl would be really like, crushing on. Um <laughs> Uh, and so he was also questioned about a sequel of the book, and he said there's no point in writing something less than the first book, so he's not rushing to make any sequel. Well, I mean, but it's also like, with it being essentially a fairy tale, there, the, the way fairy tales are structured, you don't need a sequel. And I feel yeah, like, I, I, I almost him... feel like creating a sequel would make it not a fairy tale. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was him politely saying, I'm not going to write a sequel. (laughs) Well, and I mean, let's not forget not too long ago, the sequel to To Kill a Mockingbird came out and it sucked. Like, sometimes. I liked liked Go Set a Watchman. I didn't. I didn't read it. I just know that the response was that it sucked. Everybody (laughs) was. I don't know. Everybody was shocked that years later Atticus was a racist. (laughs) Really? No, but um, but yeah, I I don't think that it's worth. And and also, I find it weird that they would even ask him that because I don't think he really writes sequels. The only thing that he writes that like follows up on previous work is he works in comic books. So obviously he's going to write like 50 issues of sand. Yeah. Not like, you know, basically essentially the most you can do with that is make it a limited series. Yeah. Well, and the thing about comic books, like when you are reading them, you go by who's writing them. At least that's how I do it because that like by the time they are done with their run on the comic book, that is like its own completed story or series of stories. And then whoever takes up, that's like its own new chapter in the story. So, right, like, 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 I guess, like, there's certain people that are like, oh, I loved, I don't know, Deborah, the writer's, you know, iteration of Batman or whatever, like that's their, like that's their arc that they follow or are fans of. Well, like for instance, a uh, lesser known DC character, uh, Animal Man. I a friend turned me on to uh, Grant Morrison's run on him, and it is excellent it is one of the best superhero stories i have ever read um and it was just his take on the character you know for like a couple of years um and then obviously someone took over after him and stuff or like even uh, another example like one of my favorite other another dc character but swamp thing uh alan moore took over and it was like and in the original run of swamp thing the first like 14 or so issues uh were like really good but then you know there was like a period of time it wasn't so good and then alan moore took over like that's how it works you know um yeah but when it comes to his novels he doesn't write sequels so i thought that was a weird thing for someone to ask and i don't think this should have a sequel either in movie form or in book form because like you said it's kind of like it's 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 like a modern fairy tale or like fable or like spooky bedtime story and it just 
it would cheapen it and yeah. it would suck. And and what what are you going to do? Like the I best mean, the best case scenario in my opinion is someone else moves into that house and has to deal with the bell dam. But then it's just going to be kind of a rehash, you Yeah, know? but the uh, basically then at that point you get you you get to the the only way you could really make a sequel is if you essentially undo whatever was done in this movie and people hate that as we've seen with the Terminator universe. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, yeah. Well, so, like, another thing I kind of wanted to touch on that I didn't really know until going into this research is that this is almost kind of a, an accidental classic. Because you've got, um, you've got, uh, well, Neil Gaiman was working on it, so that will, or he wrote it, you know, so there was that. That was probably the best thing it had going for it. You've got, um, Henry Selleck, who... I like him, but he hadn't really made a movie in a very long time. And, you know, his his track record was kind of spotty. Yeah. Cast looking into it was kind of all over the place. Uh, the You know, one thing I, I, I looked into, and I looked into it and found out that he, you know, did the, the music for The Secret of Kells. I really liked the, the music to this, so I made sure to look up the composer because I was like, this has to be someone big. Mm-hmm. Not at all. Wow. Not at all. Bruno, bless his heart, he killed it with his soundtrack, but he mostly worked in, like, again, I, I think he's French, but, like, all of his credits are, like, these TV shows, like, these foreign TV shows. Like, he doesn't even really score movies, and it's just, like, prolific. I'll say that. I think he has, like, 200 credits or something, but it's, like, he's never really done any, like, big movies besides this and The Secret of Kells. So that was interesting, especially because I, as I said, I really love it. I thinking of that opening title sequence. I don't know if that gave you the chills with like the kind of the children chanting sort of. Yeah, something about that. It, you what it kind of reminded me of. Um, I know you've seen this, uh, the original Amityville Horror. Oh yeah, no, exactly. That is exactly perfect. That is ex- perfect. I uh, that's that is ex. I'm repeating myself. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head, but that is the vibe I got from this one. There's I... that creepy children chanting sort of thing. And and not just the creepiness, but uh, even when Coraline's kind of bored around the house and there's this very, like, subdued, you know, melancholy, mellow sort of string piece. You know, she's skipping in puddles and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, it almost sounds like a harp. Yeah. You know, uh, so it's there's it's a... interesting to me that he hasn't done so much because he it's it's on the same level as like a really big movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, it was a big movie, but it just blew my mind that the composer had not done so much. Well, and, you know, and like you said, I, it's for some reason and even as a writer, music has always been a very very important part of the film watching experience for me it's it inspires me how i write it inspires everything and so there are some people and i actually went to school with some of these people were taught by some of these people who were who would apologize for movies or anything that are heavily scored and i'm like why that's like music is such an incredible part of the filming process because i mean to me there's a difference between filmmaking and cinema Film is just literally, to me, filmmaking is literally putting an image onto film. That's all it is. But to me, cinema is when you marry all of these amazing, uh, just different avenues of art direction, film, uh, the the physical cinematography, the sound, the music, and when you, and when music is added, it's it especially when it's done in a way that it stands out to you like as this is a great score to me that's just incredible and i wish more people in filmmaking would give scores much more credit than i think they do especially like i think right now i feel like there's a push to make things more quieter and and like less is more almost and i it's like if i ever were to make a film i would always push against it because to me music is like one of the it's, it's usually one of my favorite parts of a movie and you know like in a score I don't know. Scores are just magical to me. And so like you said, in this movie, when it does have an opportunity to kind of, you know, speak for itself and, and really kind of stand out, not as in a um, it's out of place here, but stand out as in it caught your attention. 
I think that's incredible. Like one of the first things, you know, I love the Silence of the Lambs, but one of the first thing that always stood out to me was the score for that movie I thought was incredible. And this is another movie where the score is just so beautiful that, you know, it's almost impossible to really separate the two as to me as far as, because to me the music is just another part of the storytelling process. Like I went out and was like, after I saw this, I, I wanted to get the score on vinyl. And unfortunately, I guess I missed the window of time that they released it. So now it's only available for like two hundred and fifty dollars on eBay, <laughs> but like you said, like you just said, the score in this movie was just so beautiful. And I know I, I don't know who you've been talking to, but it sounds like they're taking crazy pills. Uh, well, that w- <laughs> I uh, I mean, like I I do think there's an argument to be made about something being overscored. Uh, but to say like music, what are you talking about? Like who? I, again, I don't know who you were talking to, but that's literally insane. Um, even in movies where there's kind of a, a, a less is more sort of musical touch. Mm-hmm. Are you joking? Like uh, some of the best movies ever, like you could pick out any Spielberg movie. Cause I'm thinking of like E.T. or Jaws. You'd look at Lord of the Rings, you look at Star Wars. And I know I'm talking about like big budget, like Hollywood movies, but even in really good, like art. Ha- so I haven't shown you a racer head. But, like, sound design is such a big part of movies, and that's not yeah. exactly music. But I just find this so interesting is, like, his, so David Lynch's first film, Eraserhead, it's it's surrealist horror. But it's one thing that a lot of people say when they see it is, like, oh, it sounds terrible. Because there's, <laughs> there's this undercurrent of just white noise of just... Well, it is obvious. intentional. Yeah, it's it is intentional. Purpose. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I mean, like, so th- that movie took seven years for David Lynch to make. Four years of that movie was on sound design. Wow. So, yes, like, that noise that you're hearing is part of the, like, atmosphere he's trying to create. You can hate it if you want, but it is intentional. And it's the same thing with movies. And, and there, it depends on the type of movie you're making. Uh, I've mentioned Inception before on the show somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I noticed one of the times rewatching it is there is not a silent moment in the movie. There's constantly music happening. And it works because it is an action movie and it is like constantly pushing that tension. You can't do that in every movie because that would get grating. But when like you're constantly like, oh, we need to do this, we need to do this, you've got to have that kind of extra push in it. Um, and it's, it's, it is important. I, I, again, I wholeheartedly agree with you that the musical composition is super important in filmmaking. And I'd love to hear someone say otherwise, because I don't know what they're talking about. I do think there are times when it's appropriate to not have music, Mm -hmm. but to like have a movie with no score is kind of, it's a choice. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's it's a choice you can make i'll say that much I, and it might it, work it, it, it might of, work it kind of goes back and i think you heard this a lot and i ne- I never understood this argument and maybe you understood it i never got when i would have professors tell me they were like oh you know it's a good movie if you can turn off the sound and still know what's going on and but these are the same people that say like you shouldn't put anything extra in there and so i was like that never made any sense to me because there's so much secondary information that you get not necessarily from dialogue but from sound effects from music that so I'm like, what they're saying it's not literally you should not have like so it's because i've talked to you about cinematography on this show and in our personal life and stuff and that's kind of what they're getting at is if you are effectively telling a story visually then you shouldn't need to hear the dialogue, to understand what's going on, because you should be able to watch the images and kind of, like, for instance, um, you know, I'll give a couple of of examples, but if you're watching a scary movie and you turn the sound off, you can probably tell it's a scary movie by just looking at it, right? Right. Okay, so you're talking about things like And same thing with Gone with the Wind, one of your favorite movies. You might not understand what's going on, like you might like if you don't know your history, you might not even understand the time period or the context. But you watching will kind of get an idea of what's going on, who the main character is. Mm-hmm. You know, like for instance, the scene uh, where uh, 
Scarlet's first husband passes and she's at like that party and she wants to have a good time, but she's supposed to be mourning. Yeah. You can get a lot of that from how it's framed, her performance and stuff. And you can tell, even if you turn the sound off and you didn't hear everyone gossiping about what happened, you could tell, oh, she's wearing black. So her yeah. husband must be dead. Basically, I guess, and you can I guess get from mean. her trying to dance and stuff that she wants to have a good time. That's what they're talking about. Like it's, it's not that you shouldn't have dialogue or sound effects or anything. It's that from the filmmaking side of it, just from the cinematography, you should be able to understand what's going on without all of the extra stuff in it. At least if you're telling the story effectively as a visual medium. Like when you say not here, basically you mean you get the broad picture of what's going on, right? Exactly. Okay. It's not, you know, like obviously you will need dialogue and stuff like that. But again, like if you're a movie that is not shot well or the cinematography is bad quote unquote that is where that would come in you know it might not be the worst movie but like again like if you if you turn the sound off and you were like what is this like is this like a con like if it looked like a tv show or something like and you couldn't even guess what the genre is like is this a comedy or something you know that's when it is not you know it, it's not shot well that's and again this is all subjective like you can you can break the rules if you're creative enough and stuff but just speaking generally about Got what it. works and what doesn't work see um that's what i that's what they're trying to say anyway when see, they when you've heard that and you're this is why i was bad right. at film school <laughs> well and it's if cinematography is not something that like you know we have different interests in the film medium so like this is something i find really interesting and I like photography and I like cinematography and there's all that, but that's what they're talking about. It's not like you should, you shouldn't have any music or any sound effects. It's like, no, um, but you should be able to get a gist of what the movie is you're watching just by looking at it. See, and that makes more sense. And I guess I just take things too literally <laughs> I'm just, and I'm just over here like, yeah, but I would totally miss the fact they would, that this X backstory is happening. And if they wish, well, it, it sounds stupid, to... but if they just said the general idea. <laughs> well, like do you, here we'll use, since we're talking about Coraline, we'll use this as an example, like the color palette, uh, based on the real world and her, you know, other world. You can tell that one is re supposed oh, yeah. to be like the real, you know, boring humdrum life. And then one is hyper colorful and exciting and stuff. And you can just tell that from like the color palette of the movie. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. You know, definitely. And that's, exactly. And you could probably also pick up like, oh, one is supposed to be like fake and the other one. Anyway, like that's that's another example. But um. Yeah. Speaking of, so speaking of going that, back to we we went off on a tangent. So did. what I was trying to get at when I was talking about the composer and the director and all of this stuff, and the fact that like I the Bell Dam, uh, Terry Hatcher did like an excellent job at voice acting, but she hasn't really been on much besides like you know having some prominent roles on television. Um, and obviously, you know Dakota Fanning's a big star, but she wasn't necessarily. Actually, I do think they used that a little bit in the marketing because she was kind of coming up as a star at that yeah, point. I think, but I think seems at that like, point, I think I knew who Dakota Fanning was. But this seems like a... Uh, well, I knew who she was because she was in War of the Worlds. But anyway, like I, <laughs> this movie almost seems like a, a classic accidentally was made because this was like one of the earlier films from Leica. You had a director who hadn't done anything in a really long time. You did have some excellent source material they were working mm -hmm. with. But that, and then the cast is just kind of a bunch of, you had Dakota Fanning and Keith David was a big star. He's, you know, not, not as big. Obviously nerds like me will be like, it's the guy, that voice sounds familiar. It's the guy from The Thing. But, you know, it almost seems like well, it was just the perfect storm of things to to make something really good. Well, and I like um, I, like I've always thought, and I think and I think you'll agree with this in this point is the best like the or the things that are truly become true classics, not things that are said that they are classics, but that have become true classics in our cultural lexicon are things that we're not trying to be. For sure. Like even For and sure. I keep referencing even Gone with the Wind was not made to be this cultural icon they basically just made a essentially a blockbuster <laughs> or i mean we we talked about this last year but like uh uh citizen kane was just orson wells trying to take shots at hearst right i love <laughs> you know, that he, it was more of a hit piece than him trying to make like the greatest film of all time it was just it you was know? it was based i love i love how the greatest film of all time was basically somebody just being petty 
<laughs> Pretty much. It was the screenwriter being petty. That, I don't know if you watched uh, uh, the movie that came out on Netflix. Oh, gosh. What was it called? Um, I know what you're talking about. You know we talked talking about. Yeah, we talked about it. Yeah. But was there anything uh, we haven't touched on on Coraline that you wanted to bring okay, up? I wanted to because, like I said, I looked, I looked into this movie Zero because for obvious reasons we were going to discuss it now was this animated or was this stop motion stop motion okay. and that's the thing about Leica. that is all they do so paranorman stop motion kubo and the two strings like that is specifically the type of film they make so if it's a Leica movie or Leica or however you pronounce it it's going to be a stop motion flick and the cool thing is they're all different genres too kubo and the two strings is a martial arts movie <laughs> this all it over is the place. beautiful it is so gorgeous it is like and it looks oh man you need to go through their catalog i really think you'd like paranorman specifically but all of their movies i still need to see box trolls and uh the missing link but everything they've put out i've been a big well, fan of specifically with this movie and the reason why i asked that was because the stop motion was so fluid that, oh, yeah. That's why I had to clarify, because it looked, I mean, the, the forming of the pieces and the way that they looked, they looked like they had been done, I'm like, oh, this must be stop motion, but like I said, the motion was so fluid. And usually stop motion is, but like there's always, in most stop motion pieces, there's always like, you can always, there's, I don't know how to describe it, but you can always kind of just tell. It's like, uh, it's like, okay, maybe you get this reference if you don't, it's like when you're watching daytime TV. And you can tell what is a TV show and what is a soap opera just because they just look different. Do you know what I mean? I know what you mean. Yeah, That's part of the reason, like, so I, br I was talking about how great Kubo and the Two Strings is. The reason I was, like, very big on it is a martial arts movie is when you are doing all of this action and flips and fighting and stuff, it is so fluid in that movie. And it is also stop motion. And it is as good as, like, an action movie it is ridiculous and it's not even my favorite film that they've put out but just from the action it's the same with this movie where it is so perfectly animated it yeah. really blows you away right that's and why I, I was like was this 3d animation or was the stop motion because it looked claymation <laughs> nah, it's uh and that's that's kind of the cool thing and i wonder again i'm not sure if this was their first movie but if it was i'm guessing that's why they got henry Selick because that is almost exclusively what he did in the you know when he was directing movies yeah. was he was doing stop motion animation because i because let me see think the last before this and the last stop motion movie i'd seen uh it was but i forget now what it's called oh it was called early man that's what it was it was early man um, oh yeah and you know like that was very fluid too but it still you know had that stop motion feel to it but this one like i said because of the way they look the characters were designed i thought stop motion but i had to confirm because like i said it was just so fluid that i could have just been like this was animated to look stop motion but that was really good but this was a just knock it out of the park great movie I'm actually curious to watch this because um, I want to watch this again, but like usually things that are kind of like scarier sort of like this, I like to watch. I think I've told you about this. I have like this like 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 a uh, 12 inch black and white TV that my mom had when she was in middle school that I hooked up a, 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 a an Amazon Fire Stick to. Uh, but I'm curious to watch this on there and kind of see. I know, which I know it's to be like, oh, a lot of the magic comes from the colors and everything. But I want to kind of see how that enhances or detracts the story. Because with it, there's just something about horror and black and white that just go hand in hand. So uh, it actually looks pretty good. Because, so remember how I told you when it came out on Blu-ray, it was like the stupid 3D with the color glasses? Yeah. So because of that it kind of felt like watching a black and white movie when I saw this at like home on the TV. <laughs> so I can say that it actually does look pretty cool in black and white. Okay. I'm, so, I'm, uh, so, so I'm so try it out. Honestly, it's, it's pretty good. But you know, the funny thing is since doing this show with you, um, you tend to like the horror movies. I suggest, I think you like it more than you realize. It's only whenever I like, per, I, I suggest something like uh, last month like killing of the sacred deer when i when i suggest something kind of weird and like an art house like experimental movie you tend to not like it so much but so far well, you know you really liked friday the 13th mm -hmm. 
Friday um, the 13th. I really liked uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 2. You know, and I'm trying That's to think true. of some well, other and you know what's movies. funny is I think I think I've I think I've, we've had this conversation before. It's I like it's when it gets to a certain level of darkness is when I can't tolerate it. And I think with Friday the Twenty Eight Days Later, you liked twenty. I, okay, I I appreciated that. It's not. No, a my you go-to. liked it. You you said even during the review you'd watch it okay. again. That's true, but you know why? It's because I found out after I watched it that it has an uplifting ending. Right. It's 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 a big, um, but like movies like Killing of a Sacred Deer, like for example, was just and I and, I, and, oh, I, and yeah. it was dark. It was just, it was just so dark for me that I was kind of just like, uh, I was well, just, that's the thing. Like, d- I mean, it depends on the movie. Obviously, a lot of horror movies have bummer endings, but sometimes, I mean, like you seem to have gotten into slasher, and I think part of that is because you've got the final girl element, so you've got someone who's going to survive and defeat the the slasher by the end of the movie i mean i'm i'm currently reading a book called the final girl support group (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah you were telling me about that no but i think i think was i think the but i think but i think what this movie does so well is it's creepy it's scary but there's just something about it that is just and i think like i said earlier it's just, there's just something so warming about it you know it's it's blue it's kind of it's it's just kind of a sad life sort of at least at the beginning but something about her is just so warming and i don't know if necessarily it's because i saw a uh, young me and caroline and coraline don't uh, call her Carol. i know i said that <laughs> i'm so sorry and in coraline like what like when she's uh, the, the, the when she busy, I mean, I know her dad gives her the, the task, but when she busies herself by counting the windows and doors, that's something I would have done at like five or so. I could see me doing that. And I am embarrassed that I still do this. But like when, when she's trying to get her dad's attention, she starts squeaking the door back and forth. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I do that. But like, just even, something about it was just, there was something so warming about this. And I think, I think that's kind of almost like the best kind of horror I don't know if it's feel good horror is the right name. <laughs> when there's I know something, what you mean. there's something that's just inherently human in it, and when I mean human, I don't mean I don't mean like the struggle to survive. I mean like something that reminds us that we're not just animals, but we're also human. I don't know. I don't know how to trip, but this movie has it, and that's one of the reasons why I really, really enjoyed this. And I'm actually based on your recommendation. I'm eager to check out Paranorman. Uh, I think you'll like it maybe better. Again, I don't want to spoil what it's about, but I think the subject matter will really tug at your heartstrings more than you expect. And unlike this movie, Paranorman, I would not consider a scary movie at all. Uh, It's got some horror elements. Essentially, it's like, it's about a guy who can talk to dead people. So it's like the kid from... uh, The Sixth Sense. The Sixth Sense, except really I'm so mad that that was ruined for me. I will never. I I want a refund of my tuition on the for that fact alone. Gotcha. But yeah. So that's all. A paranormal. He could talk to dead people, and stuff happens, and you'll see what happens. But it's very wholesome. Like he he gets to talk to his grandmother, even though she's dead. Like they're sitting in the living room watching movies and stuff. It's very, it's very nice. It's got there was, and it's got one of the few like openly gay characters. Um in like an animated kids movie before disney kept trying to fake oh god <laughs> fake put Di- characters disney in their disney and their queer baiting oh so yeah there you go like you should uh you should check out paranorman and see if you can guess which character is going to be the gay character <laughs> what was i gonna say there because was... it will not be who you expect <laughs> wait have i seen this before Wait, hold on. I think I may have seen this. Okay, I need to watch it now because I think I may have seen this scene online. <laughs> Boom, I got you. But so um, it sounds like oh, this is a recommendation. Oh, yeah, for, definitely um, a recommendation. So anyway, yes. do you like Coraline? Will you let us know in the comments? <laughs> please uh, please be sure to uh, recommend something if you think that T or I should take a look at it or hit us up on Twitter. Thanks for hanging out with us, guys. If you're so inclined, like and subscribe and all that stuff. If you're watching this on a different platform, feel free to check out one of our many other episodes. Now, now, Whiskey, um, you know they're listening to us on other platforms, not watching us. <laughs> <bleh>. <laughs> You're listening to us on every platform because we 
We just do this. And we uh, also leave button-eyed dolls around for you, so keep that in mind. <laughs> yes, be sure to burn any button-eyed dolls so the Beldam can't sp spy on you. But thanks for chilling with us, guys. We are excited to see you guys next month. Where do we even have a theme? I already forgot. I know what we we're watching. We do have next a theme. Month, but... Next month, if I am thinking correctly, next month is crud. What is it called? Oh, like really experimental films. That's right. That's right. It's experimental month next month. I cannot um, wait for so you to watch be... my pick. <laughs> and I can't wait for you to watch my pick. <laughs> So anyway, stay thirsty, guys, and thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining and being a part of Whiskey's annual Nightmare in a Rocks class. And I promise Shh. you next year he will be part of the marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Halloween, Katie. all. <laughs> Happy Halloween, guys. Till next time. Reels on the Rocks is a production of La Prince Laboratories. It is edited and produced by Alejandro Castillo and features original artwork by Ace Esparza and original music by Pat Mars. Follow us on Twitter at Reels on the Rocks and tweet at us with any movies or topics you'd like us to discuss in the future.